Here we go, folks. It is a one, two, three things Thursday, two days until Ohio State plays Marshall. One show right here with me and Berm uh, to get you set for Ohio State and Marshall. We'll have Freaky Friday. We'll have Bill Anderson in the mix. But this is the only time, Berm, that you and me have had a TPD all to ourselves this week. Yeah, it feels good. Kind of sick of seeing Bill's face, to be honest. The man is everywhere. He's given all the yeah. information talking about the North and Ohio State. You and I are just focused on the Buckeyes. And so here's what we're going to do on three things this week. By the way, I'm Austin. Moore. He's burned. Uh, number one is something. The first thing is a thing that you are absolutely certain that you are going to see on Saturday in Ohio State and Marshall. The second thing, a thing that you are curious if you're going to see it as the Buckeyes play Marshall. And the third thing is going to be a thing that has annoyed you since the last time we've got to see Ohio State play, because I think I know what your selection will be, because uh, it is, as you called it, talk about Ohio State season for mm. many people across the country. So we'll get to that in a little bit, but let's start with something that you're positive that you're going to see on Saturday. I am positive I'm going to see another Jeremiah Smith touchdown on Saturday. Um, and it probably will be two, but we're not doing the. Uh, this is not bold piece. This is not bold piece. This is not things I'm probably going to see. Uh, I definitely know where I will see another Jeremiah Smith touchdown, and it will be another moment where people watch him and go, "That's not right. That's not fair. That's not something a true freshman should be doing." Um, and that's becoming the norm, and it will be the norm. Uh, when you know, it's crazy to think that we're in a world now where. A freshman wide receiver at Ohio State is so good compared to everything we've seen in the last half of decade uh, at, at the wide receiver position for Ohio State. Every one of those guys, as good as they were, as highly ranked as they were, as well regarded as they were nationally, every every single one of them came with the the asterisk that, that hey, he's a freshman, give it time, he'll he'll get his moment. And if you look at the room, rest of the current Ohio State receiver room. There's enough talent there that that would have been a measured and reasonable take when it came to Jeremiah Smith, and yet he is so much better than anybody could have imagined he was going to be and so much more dominant as a player. And again, I know people, oh, it's played two games. It's been against two MAC teams. It doesn't matter. I'm telling you, folks, it's not going to matter who they play. Jeremiah Smith is that guy, and he's that much different even than the greatest Ohio State receivers we've seen in the last few years. And we've seen some of the all-time greats. He is potentially that much different. And I, I hope people um, appreciate every week the opportunity to get to watch him because you're talking about a LeBron James type of player. You've been making that point about Jeremiah Smith for quite some time, but I, I'm I'm curious if he's even exceeded your expectations because of all the things that you're describing, are true they're facts we've already seen that play out in the first two games and you have said by the middle of the season he might be the best wide receiver in the country so i know that that would be difficult for him to have exceeded what you thought might be possible for him but was there not any part of that doubt in your mind like uh, i don't know it looks great in practice and spring ball is awesome and seven on seven two years ago but to go out and dominate from day one is no part of that surprising to you some of it is. I mean, it, it, because the, we we are well aware, we are, are are truly versed in the the jump from college or from high school ball to college ball, and how challenging that can be for ninety nine point nine percent of players, no matter how good they are in high school. But some guys are just different, and you know, I, I think when when we look back, I, I say LeBron James, but if you think about LeBron as a as a rookie in the NBA, right, like. He still had moments where he looked like he didn't know what he was doing necessarily. And then by the end of, of, you know, year one, year two, you're like, okay, that's, that's the guy. And there are some guys who are just different. If there's one thing about Jeremiah Smith that surprises me, it's how mature he is. Because I, I think growing up in South Florida and the, the insulated nature of high school football in that area, I don't know that it always lends itself to guys being able to handle the bright lights when, when they are, put on them in a place far away from home. And he's been exceptional in that role too. So, I mean, it, it's, it's the little things. It's the, it's the iron Buckeye thing. It's, it's stuff like that, that like we've never even considered a freshman to be in those conversations. And yet now it, it's not just 
that he's doing what everyone thought he would do on the field, but he's resetting the expectations for what other freshmen should have to do off the field to be considered a, a viable playing time option that, that early. So it's, it, it's, it's really pretty remarkable. And I, I, I do hope people will appreciate it for what it is as it's happening and not something that we have to look back on and, and say, you know, like CJ Stroud, for example, I think there's a large percentage of Ohio state fans that didn't really appreciate what he did when he was in Columbus and now everyone's a, a, a roaring C.J. Stroud fan again. But it wasn't always the case. And it doesn't matter how many games Ohio State wins or if they win national championships. I hope people can just appreciate that you're getting a chance to watch something truly unique when Jeremiah Smith's playing. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder if this is the week where there's now two two games of film for Marshall to look at to repair. I wonder if this is the – because at some point in this year, you're going to start seeing – double coverage and, and safeties going over the top of Jeremiah Smith to try and take him away. I wonder if this is like where that already begins, that Marshall Marshall had a, a date to prepare and now two examples of what this guy can really do. That doesn't mean that I'm saying that they could stop him or remove him from the equation, but I wonder if this is the beginning of like Emeka, and, Emeka Ibuka and Carnell Tate getting to really take advantage of the fact that Jeremiah Smith is in the same offense as them. I, I, it's going to happen at some point. I wonder if we're already there. Whenever it does happen, it's only going to make Ohio State a better offense, which is yeah. kind of insane. So, um, you know, I, I think people will have to pick their poison. I agree that you'll start to see coverage shaded a little bit more towards towards JJ where he is, and all that's going to do is open things up for other guys. And the Will Howard's numbers are going to go crazy, and Emeka Abuka numbers are going to go crazy, and Carnell Tate's are going to go crazy, and and the run game will will get unhitched even more than it's been. So it, it's only going to be good for Ohio State and. No, that's why college football is sort of like, well, you, you look at a guy's output and, and you can convince yourself at times like, oh, he wasn't that impactful. But like there are way more ways to be impactful than just catching footballs. Yeah, I, I think that's why I'm really certain prolific output for him, because I think that the way that the way that this offense is going and the conversation that's been had about the fastball and the prevalence where, you know, Bill looked at this, we were talking about you know, Tuesday in the Woody with Chip Kelly and RPOs and Will Howard and his comfort with it and the number of times that they're running it. And he's like, you know, Sports Info says it's 25% of the offense for the first two weeks for Ohio State. I think it's going to continue to get higher. And I think that Jeremiah Smith doesn't need and probably won't get six, seven, eight targets per game moving forward, especially if teams are intent on trying to take him away. But the ball's going to go somewhere. And I think that that's where Emeka Buka is really going to thrive. And I, Again, it, this this almost sounds like a bold prediction, but I don't I don't feel like it is. Like it is not a surprise when a Mecca Buka dominates a game. It is not a surprise that he is uh, a versatile chess piece that's going to unlock a lot more things for Ohio State. And I think that whether this is purposeful or not, whether it is the way teams have defended Ohio State in the first two weeks, I I, I don't know. There's just way more that can we know Ohio State has in the arsenal that will take advantage of a Mecca's versatility, and I just. I don't know that they had to get to that in the first two weeks. And maybe maybe there's also an element where it doesn't have to happen against Marshall if you have the Big Ten slate and going to East Lansing and Iowa and Oregon all coming after that. Maybe you can continue to to disguise some of that or keep it in the back pocket. But I, I feel really confident that he's not been underused, underutilized, or a way that would make, make Mecca unhappy if there's anything that could possibly do that to the ultimate team guy. But like, it's okay to be patient as well. I think Emeka's got that, and I, I, I think he's going to be rewarded for that, and it's going to be a reminder that you cannot just focus on Jeremiah Smith uh, on Saturday or moving forward. No, and what's interesting, I mean, Emeka has nine catches and in the first two weeks. He's averaging almost 17 yards a catch, which is way higher than where he's been at through his career. So I think you're actually seeing how – the addition of Quinshawn Judkins, the addition of a guy like Jeremiah Smith opens up Emeka Abuka to really put on display that he can do different things than he's done. This idea in the first three years of his career that he's been sort of this gadget piece or a sidekick, uh, I think it's wrong. And, you know, he was the number one ranked receiver in the country coming out of high school in the class of 2021 for a reason. And um, I would expect that we'll see a big game from him on Saturday also because he's just the type of guy that, um, is going to be open uh, and, and will Howard has done a good job finding guys who are open and Emeka seems to be always open. And, you know, he had 98 yards against Western Michigan, hundred yards against 
uh, Marshall seems like it's a fairly uh, reasonable expectation. Yeah, I think it'll be pretty good for him. What's uh, something that you are curious to see, a thing you are curious about on Saturday at noon? I'm curious to see if Ohio State can strike a better balance between Travion Henderson and Quinshot Judkins, and if we are at a point where we see them on the field together yet, or if that's something that is being held off for Big Ten purposes or whatever. I I, I think that there's an opportunity to, for each of them to be in that 12-13 carry a game range pretty easily, or 12-13 touches, let me say that, because I don't think it has to be straight out of the backfield. but um, I I'm just curious as to how Chip Kelly and Ohio State is trying to balance this out. Marshall, um, I think they missed like 17 tackles in their last game against Virginia Tech. So like those are if that's the way that they play defense, you're going to see these guys have a chance to really make some plays at the line of scrimmage because I think they also like blitzed a ton. I think they had 25 pressures or something like that against Virginia Tech. So like. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for the Buckeyes to do some stuff out of the backfield with Quinshawn and Travion, um, and their versatility allows them to do that. But I, I just I'm interested to see what the what the plan is to get them both un, unhitched early, and because we've seen first game it looked like Travion was uh, had the better juice. Game two it looked like Quinshawn had the better juice, um, and I think some of that is just how do you how early do you get going? How do you get the the juices going earlier? Um, Quinshawn, I, I think it's interesting that they're probably very opposite people when it comes to their impact on the field, where with Travion, it's like you kind of got to get him when he's fresh. And I think with Quinshawn, the longer he's in the game, the more he's pounding on the defensive uh, players who are trying to tackle him. I think the more productive he's going to get. So it, it is an interesting dichotomy between the two of them, but they they both are so unique in what they can bring to this offense. And again, it's just another facet for chip kelly and ryan day to play with and, and i'm i think we're going to see more of that this weekend just because they don't seem to tackle very well so i think we'll see both the difficult part of i think looking at that and you didn't say this but like even if the snap count is balanced that may not mean that the workload is going to be the same for them that's another uh variable in this equation with the rpos again that's not the entirety of ohio state's offense it is not ever going to be 100 percent, but it, if that 25-ish percent remains true, there could be plays where either Quinshawn or Travion are on the field and they just don't get the football because defenses are intent on taking them away. And Will Howard may may have to run more himself or it maybe throws elsewhere. So, you know, tracking some of the design stuff um, could be interesting. Uh, but I think looking at it purely from are Quinshawn and Travion going to have the exact same number of carries, that could be dictated by not just Chip Kelly, but also the defenses that that Ohio State faces throughout the course of the year. So like, that part is, I think, going to be really interesting to watch because I don't I don't expect that they're – could have said, well, in two weeks, maybe Quinchon has 10 more carries than Travion. I don't think that that would be like because they think that Quinchon is better than Travion or a you know, better fit for the offense. It's just maybe what the way the game flow goes. So the, I think anyone that expects that, and I'm not saying there's anyone out there believing that or, or that I am, that, that it had to be 50-50 for them, that's probably not realistic when it comes to carries, no matter what. Yeah, and I think that's what makes this Ohio State offense so fun to watch, but I imagine also extremely frustrating to, frustrating, frustrating to prepare for um, because every defensive coordinator's goal is to make their opponent one dimensional, right? Like every week, that's, that's the stated goal. This Ohio state team, I don't know what you want to take away more. Like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know where you want to take a part off, you know, because if, if you, if you say we're going to make Ohio state one dimensional and force Will Howard to beat us in the passing game, which I think is probably what people will, will try to to do as the Buckeyes get into the talent equated games. Th there are ways that, Quinshawn Judkins and Trayvon Henderson are equally uh, electric and equally explosive in the passing game. So, like, it, it's it's going to be really fun to watch how they deploy all this. And I, I think that that is the biggest surprise for me in the first two weeks of the season for Ohio State is just how different this offense feels, considering that it came from the the Ryan Day tree and but it seems so much different with with the way chip kelly is running things and um i don't know how 
you choose which poison to take if you're defending Ohio State because it seems like there's a loss either way. Didn't Chip Kelly plant this tree? He did, but it seems like it rooted <laughs> off and did like all of its own things. And like, you know, if we think back to to Ryan Day's hiring, nobody knew who the hell he was when he got hired, uh, you know, at Ohio State. And then the offense completely changed and everyone just goes to this idea that it's oh now it's Ohio State's so all they're going to do is pass the ball. Ryan Day doesn't run the ball, but like J.K. Dabbins ran for over 2,000 yards in 2019. Like the most productive, some of the most productive running seasons in Ohio State history have been under Ryan Day. So like it shouldn't be an entire, entirely like surprising thing that they're now this multiple, but maybe it's, it's personnel. I don't know. Maybe it's the different formational stuff. Maybe it's a different motion. Maybe it's just a willingness to run 14 plays out of 75 formations. I, I don't know what it is, but it just feels so different right now than it has. And I, it's kind of fun for from our perspective, at least I, I think so, to try to figure out where they go with it because they can literally do anything with this offense. And and some of that's just because you have the, the right trigger man and Will Howard, but some of it is just because the running backs are able to do whatever you want them to do, whether it's run blocking, pass blocking, pat, catching the ball out of the backfield, being a traditional uh, eye back. Like there's a lot of things they can do. And it's, it's, it can't be fun to try to prepare against. That's no. why you offer them all of the, you know, sandwiches or biscuits, I guess, and, and see if you can convince them to come play for your team. Mm, yeah. Unlimited biscuits is a great NIL pitch. Um, Different offshoot of that for me, which is having Donovan Jackson back and what that means for the Ohio State running game. Not for Quinshawn Judkins or Travion Henderson specifically, just like, you know, Zach Bourne brought up the point earlier in the week on Monday with the Bourne Blitz. Like, the, if there was a question for him, like the nitpicking part, what could be better running between the tackles? And I, how much will Donovan Jackson's return? influence that uh, does it change the play calling does it change the approach does it change the success what does it mean to have him next to seth mclaughlin like we already know that donovan jackson's good it should elevate the success of ohio state to have one of their seniors one of their you know top nfl draft prospects back in the lineup so what does that look like like i'm i, I don't really know i just I, I could have made that the thing that i know that like they're gonna be better they're gonna have a better game offensively to have donovan jackson back out there but it's more a curiosity of what that actually looks like in, in practice, in reality, once he's back out there. Yeah, I'm actually of the mindset that it will be worse uh, oh. for this game because it's not just a matter of the fact that Donovan Jackson didn't play the first two games. It's that also for the entire month of August, essentially, he was sidelined. And you have a new center who's never played next to him, really. Yeah, they had the spring to, to work on some stuff. But I, I, I wonder if... The time that Seth McLaughlin has had working next to Austin Saraveld and uh, Tegra Shabola, like those three may have some chemistry now. Mm. And now you have to bring in someone else who doesn't maybe have as much chemistry with that center. And um, I guess we'll find out if that really matters. And uh, that is ultimately the point I guess people are trying to make. Like, how much does a guy who's played a lot of football being brought in, how much how much time do you need to catch up? How much time do you need to get back into the the into football shape, into the understanding what's coming play by play. Um, Donovan Jackson has certainly not been perfect through his Ohio State career. So it's not like you're getting a guy that's been infallible and that hasn't had moments where you're like, oh, that's not good. So like I, I actually have of the mindset that Marshall with the type of defense they play, especially a very aggressive front four, uh, front seven really is going to try to do some things to – confuse Ohio State up front because they have a new guy in there, even though he's a new guy that's played for three years. So <laughs> I, I'm actually of the mindset that it's going to be different because the communication, the chemistry is going to be, um, you know, getting unhitched yeah. for the first time with those guys. So yeah, that, that's just me. Maybe I'm an, I'm just a negative guy. I don't know. I'm a pessimistic person. <laughs> I don't know about that. This is optimistic for him. Um, yeah. But you don't you don't have to be optimistic about this because I specifically designed the third thing to be something that's annoying to you from the last two weeks. There's so many things that are annoying to me. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start. I'm going to start with this notion. And I know that the person who mainly pushed me over the edge is just a, a well-known Ohio State agitator and gets attention for that provocateur. I don't I don't find it that provocative. So 
I guess maybe it, mm. he's getting the attention that he wants for sure. And I'm giving it to him right now, I guess, but he's not the only one. There's this notion that Ohio State like purposefully or or accidentally, however you want to view it, has played nobody or that the results from the first two weeks shouldn't matter and that they need to play somebody with a pulse. Did Notre Dame play somebody with a pulse? Did Penn State play somebody with a pulse? Did Mississippi State play somebody with a pulse? Like the way that Ohio State played is more significant than the fact that the first two opponents were in the MAC to me. And maybe that's just because I was at the games and watched them, or maybe just because I cover Ohio State. Like the way that they approached those games to me was very different than they have in other years from start to finish with aggression. Um, not perfect in week one, maybe if you want to say that in the first half, but that is that is what openers often look like. Um, and then to the way that they just loop it in, that it's like the entire schedule is is easy, is pure nonsense. Like they, they play in the Big Ten. I think everyone knows that. And they're playing nine conference games. They don't get to make their choice of those. But the way that you're looking at Nebraska coming on, the way that Michigan State has already played early in the year, we can set aside Iowa with a, a little hiccup, but you're talking about team like probably seven of the nine Big Ten teams are going to be bowl eligible by the time we're done. The schedule is really hard, so you don't. It's harder than it gets credit for, and to try and discredit it after two games and an improvement week off date is just ludicrous to me. When you see other teams around the country fail to maximize their own non-conference opportunities against the same caliber of competition. Like what, are, what are we doing here? Yeah. And also why does it matter? Well, that's the key part. It doesn't matter because it's the 12 team playoff era. Um, it also, it, it's annoying to me that this is a conversation at this point because Hey, Ohio state didn't even play this past weekend. So why are you talking about them? Get their name out your mouth. Uh, <laughs> but B Ohio State had Washington on the schedule. Washington, who was just in the national championship game 10 months ago. So if Ohio State would have still had Washington on the schedule, would, would people be, but nope, this is not the same Washington team. They stink now. So who cares? So it doesn't matter. It's about the way that you approach these things. And the reason that you're having the conversation comes from a place of just pure disingenuous nonsense. Because the conversation should be, if you if you must talk about Ohio State, and I understand that nationally there's probably some sort of imperative uh, or some sort of like requirement that these uh, guys around the country have because the Buckeyes uh, fan base is so big and so willing to defend them. And here we are talking about it. The conversation is simple in that you can say, hey, the Buckeyes looked pretty good in their first two games. They didn't really play anybody of, of note. I can't wait till that October 12th game against Oregon to see what really... Like, this isn't an Ohio State team. Let's say Tennessee, for example. Let, let's use Tennessee. And I, I'm not coming at Vol Twitter here or anyone else, but I think that they're a pretty good example of a team that nationally people are just sucking their teeth. Um, uh, talking about how what? good Tennessee is, right? They're talking about how good Tennessee is. Oh, they're patting them on the back. While they have not played anybody of note either, um, and they are a team that did not come, you know, they, they are not a perennial national champion contender. They are not a team that was discussed all off season as the top two team in the country. If Ohio state had played Notre Dame this year, instead of last, would people would be talking about how Ohio state was overrated because they only won 17 to 14. So like, it doesn't matter we we know that the conversation comes from a place of just I'm trying to drive clickbait crap to my website, but there are teams around the country who people in that position are going to be stroking like Tennessee, even though they're in the exact same position that Ohio State's in, in the fact that they've played absolutely nobody of note in the first couple of weeks of the season. So it, it's it's obviously selective and disingenuous. Um, you know, Michigan fans will say, oh, Ohio State fans were all bemoaning the fact that, you know, Michigan didn't play anybody the last couple of years. And that's true. 
but who cares? It doesn't matter. Like a, that's the difference between being rivals and being some national talking head who has nothing else to do but uh, try and get. This is the problem with the monetized Twitter. Okay, let's be very clear. <laughs> like, there's a lot of problems with monetized Twitter. Number one, you can't even open it in public anymore because it just seems like it's like anybody. Anyone who follows, anybody who's watching you use Twitter in public these days must think that every single person is just a full-born perv. You know what I mean? Because it is it is just nudity all over the place. And, and I don't know why we're doing that, Elon. Elon, if you're listening, can we just put a little block on that? Is there a way we can say, can we opt out of that? Like, I'm here to talk about sports. It's very weird. Um, uh, but yeah, but the, this is also the reason why I, I've made this point before and you can't on one hand say these non-conference games are really important. Like they subsidize athletic departments for the Mac, for the Sun Belt, for the Mountain West conference. Like they're important. They're, they're fabrics of the game. And these, these young student athletes deserve opportunities to go play in the horseshoe or Neyland stadium or Bryant Denny or or the big house and then be like well like this schedule sucks like you yeah. can't what are you doing you cannot have it both ways in if you are moving forward in this playoff expansion era where you have said that the conference games are your most valuable and I hate the word your most valuable inventory and it is the clearest most most defined path to earn a playoff bid then your non-conference games should not be scheduled competitively. And in fact, I believe they should not exist at all. They should. We are in an 18-team Big Ten. You should be playing nothing but conference games. And then you'll remove any part of this conversation where you're going to try and attack one team's non-conference resume over another. Or, And it's never been proven that you're actually going to reward somebody playing like LSU and USC did because the selection committee has still proven time and time and time and time and time and time and time again that the win loss record is the only thing that ultimately matters to them. So let's just embrace what this actual reality is and yeah. get rid of nonsense arguments like playing Mac teams is irrelevant. A, ask Notre Dame how relevant it is. I'm going to keep making that point because it is hilarious and it undermines all of it. But B, if conference games are what's important, and the Big Ten Conference is really good, and it's deeper than it maybe gets credit for, then just play Big Ten games. Just do it. Right. And that's the way we will get to the point where the the SEC sunshine pumpers who who chant SEC, SEC at bowl games, even you know for, for some reason, which is the weirdest thing that any fans anywhere do, um, if you really want to make it uh, about the SEC versus the Big Ten, Play all SEC teams if you're in the SEC. Get a true champion of the SEC versus a true champion of the Big Ten or Pac-12 or whatever conferences exist in the future, and play them that way. It like Ohio State needs to call Texas probably today and say, "Hey, we're not playing you next year," and, and call Alabama and say, "2027, sorry, we're not doing that schedule." Like it, it's irrelevant, it's pointless, it's dumb. Yeah, it sucks for people who want to travel. You can, nothing stops you as a as an Alabama fan if you want to see a game at Ohio Stadium from just coming up and going to a game at Ohio Stadium. It doesn't have to be against Alabama. If if you're a Buckeye fan and you want to see a game uh, it, in Bryant Denny, go down to Alabama and watch one. Like nothing stops you from doing that. But it, this idea that they have to play these marquee games in this new world is dumb. It's stupid. It's irrelevant. I've always been a proponent. Of, like it's. You, you have these marquee games and it's exciting and it's fun and people want to see them, but scheduling them in the regular season does not make any sense mm. whatsoever. There's no value. You gain nothing. And especially now when they're putting playoff games in campus sites. So we may well see Alabama play in the horseshoe someday or Georgia or Texas or whoever. So, but getting to that point by continuing to have these games and like, I understand Ohio State got some benefit out of having a non-conference schedule that amounted to an NFL preseason. And then they had the off week and that sucked. And that was like, we had too much time after just getting two games to look at that. That annoyed me too. But what, what is better for college football to have those tune up games, whether that's Ohio State or Tennessee, either one to use your example of maximize, like just blowing people out, like getting, 
four quarterbacks onto the field, or just go ahead and start it in your schedule and playing 12 Big Ten games or 12 SEC games. And since that is the only thing that has been decided as a path to get to the playoff, like which one of those is better? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, Tennessee played an FBS school. Okay. Like that's the conversation that needs to happen far faster than worrying about Ohio State playing two max schools. Now, if you, why are SEC teams still playing FBS schools? Like let's, FCS. let's, stop. FCS. FCS. let's stop doing that. Let's stop doing that. Okay. Like yeah. that's, that's silly. Number one, you're going to get those kids hurt. Number two, how does it help anybody? And this is why we go back to a year ago. And I said it then, if you want, the big games early in the season. Let's have Ohio State, Michigan be the kickoff of, the, of every year. Let's have Alabama, Georgia be the first weekend. Those teams are very likely going to run into each other again in the in their in their conference title game or in the in the playoff. So let's just let's find ways to get better games early. Let's have Ohio State, Oregon, week one instead of in the middle of October. Let's. There's plenty of ways to do it. If you play a 12 team Big Ten schedule every year, that's going to be much better, much more interesting football than ever adding these other schools from around the country. Couldn't agree more. But instead, we're going to watch Ohio State play another non-conference game on Saturday at noon against Marshall. And uh, we're going to have full coverage of it like we always do, no matter who the Buckeyes play. So uh, get ready for that one. Get ready for uh, a Freaky Friday Bold Predictions episode tomorrow with the three of us, Bill, uh, Berm, and myself. Uh, And we'll be back uh, to talk about the Buckeyes then. Uh, Thanks for joining us on a Three Things Thursday. He's Berm. I'm Austin. Enjoy the rest of your day. See ya.